I think, um, you know, talking about that uh, marriage between a man and a woman, and lately there's been a lot of controversy about um, places that have been asked to do something for homosexual marriages. And, um, it, and, I, and I'm just giving, this is just my opinion here, all right? Uh, but I think there's some good scriptural context for it. And, and this does not apply everywhere, what I'm about to say. But I think as much as we can, when somebody who's a sinner is asking us to do something, even though they're sinners and we're Christians, when they're asking us to do something, I think the scriptural mandate is to comply and give them what they want. And the reason I say that is Jesus was teaching and said, if somebody asks you for your coat, what are you supposed to do? And, and, and if somebody tells you, carry my stuff a mile, you're supposed to do what? Carry it two miles. Now, this was not just your buddy Joe saying, hey, can you help me carry my stuff to work? This was in the context of Roman soldiers who would you know, conscript people to carry stuff for them. Probably, typically, it was their bag, you know, their big bag of supplies and their shield because they didn't want to be lugging it around. So what would they do? They'd grab somebody off the street and say, hey, carry this stuff so I don't have to. And Jesus is saying, okay, if they ask you to do that for one mile, you should go two. And I want to tell you what, the Jews hated the Romans. And this would have been like, I'm not going to do that. We hate them. You know. And so that's why I'm saying, I mean, I know it doesn't apply everywhere. And if somebody, if, if, if a Nazi came into a Jewish bakery and said, hey, we want swastikas on our cake, I don't think you, need, you have to do that. But if a Nazi walks into a bakery and says, I want a cake, I think you can give him a cake. You see what I'm saying? And uh, I don't know. That's just my take on that. All right. Let's look at uh, God Don't Make No Junk. And I know that's bad English, but that's the title of my dad's book. And once again, that's online if you'd like to read it. It's a lot of fun. My dad had an amazing life. And then uh, today we're talking about the story of Mary Magdalene. And uh, Magdalene is, you know, means she comes from the city of Magdala, which was on the uh, south shore of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, of all things, this town was known for prostitution. What a great moniker, right? <laughs> Come to our town. We're good at prostitution. And um, Jesus and his ministry happened, she happened to come to his ministry around the Sea of Galilee, and she was delivered from seven demonic spirits. And we know Jesus gave a teaching about demonic forces, and uh, Jesus believed in demons. Demon, the devil is real, demons are real. There's not a demon behind every bush or behind every tree or behind every whatever, but there are demonic forces in this world, and um, Jesus dealt with them frequently. And he gave a teaching talking about how sometimes if someone has a demonic spirit in their life, and they get rid of that demonic force, but they don't put something back in the, the, their life, the house was the way he described it, if they clean house, but then don't put something else in there, seven demonic spirits might come and take up residence in the house. And so I don't know if that's what happened to her, but the number fits. Uh, but at any rate, Jesus cleaned house for her the first time or the second time, whatever it was. And she was set free and, and her life was transformed. It was totally changed. Now, some people associate her with one of the women who anointed the feet of Jesus, but there's no really scriptural connection for that, that's just kind of a legend. And the same way that some people associate Mary Magdalene with the adulterous woman who was brought before Jesus and they were gonna stone her. Once again, that's not a biblically based, that's a, that's a legend. Um, 
But she did start following Jesus Christ in her ministry, and she uh, traveled with him, and several other women traveled with him. And uh, we don't know but who had the money, but these women supported Jesus' ministry. And that was something that happened in that, that culture. Rabbis would be supported by men and women, but wealthy women would come in and help um, support a rabbi's ministry. And so it appears that uh, she was with that group of women. doesn't say specifically what she gave or how much or anything like that, but apparently she was helping support the ministry. But a, a strange thing is that women were actually being disciples and following Jesus around the countryside. That was not right. And, and, and Jesus was ministering to women. That, that was not something you should be doing either. And, and so he was breaking the code of the rabbis and the, you know, the Jewish customs. But he had a really powerful effect on people. And his closest disciples, obviously, were radically transformed by what Jesus said. So you, you see him, see her in this context, and then she's at the crucifixion, and she's with uh, Jesus' mother and with John, and s several other women are there. They're watching. It seemed to be a pretty good crowd of women. The, the rest of the guys have all, I don't know where they were. They've run away. They're or they're hiding in the shadows, uh, but uh, they're not listed as being at the crucifixion. And, and she was there, uh, you can see there in Matthew, uh, among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Um, and uh, in the end of the Mark 15 passage, it says many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. And so she's there, then she's there at the death of Christ, and she's there at the burial. She sees Joseph of Arimathea take the body and she follows him to the garden tomb. And she sees Jesus put into the tomb. And so she knows where Jesus is. And uh, the Sabbath was coming. Um, and so they couldn't do all the burial uh, spices that they wanted to do. And so they were gonna come back. And so she comes back on Sunday and after the Sabbath, and the stone is rolled away, and she's traumatized. And where's Jesus? And the angel appears to her, and she ends up being commissioned by the angel and by Jesus as the first witness of the resurrection. This is another thing that should not happen, because women were not allowed to be witnesses in that culture. And it's pretty interesting that God chose her and he chose somebody that had had seven demons. Um, so when we start thinking in the context, God don't make no junk, it doesn't matter what in the world you came from. If you came from a town of prostitutes with seven demons, you can end up being the person who announces Jesus is alive. Nobody believed her, but she still got to announce it. You just, you picture that, her coming in and saying, really, you got to? And I think the video that we shot is a beautiful <laughs> representation of that, you know, and how well our people did at representing what the disciples would have been like. Oh, come on. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Crazy, silly women. It's no wonder that the theory arose that, you know, that she was lost and went to the wrong tomb, right? And went to an empty tomb by accident. I don't know how you explain the angel, explain Jesus. But when Peter and John ran to the right tomb, they'd have ended her story, right? But she obviously knew where she was going and she identified the right tomb and she became this first witness for Jesus Christ. I think that, you know, we tend to get so afraid about the story of Jesus Christ and about the resurrection. Oh, man. 
That sounds crazy. You know, when I, I watch television shows, everything goes through my biblical worldview filter. Do you do that? Everything. I mean, somebody says something, and I'm like, oh, here's the answer. I wish I could get on and talk to those things because Law and Order was on the other day. And this, I think his name's Sisto. And, and, and he says, because the other guy's kind of talking about he thinks some of the stuff in the Bible is true. And he said, oh, so you think Jesus is going to come down from the sky with a real sarcastic, dripping voice, you know? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and let me show you how we know that's true. We've got something the world needs so desperately. And we need to walk around like Mary Magdalene, who, you know, if you have seven demonic spirits controlling your life and then you're totally set free, she's like, oh, wow, I am following you for the rest of my life. I'm going to support your ministry. I'm putting my money into you because you've changed my life. And, and I'm following you everywhere. And she was lost when she walked into that garden and that tomb was empty. She was lost. She was broken. Her spirit was crushed. She was like, oh my gosh, he's dead. And now they've stolen the body. She had nothing. And then all of a sudden, wham, he's alive. And she wants to grab hold of him and worship him and say, oh, you're here. And you are the Lord. You are the Savior. And he says, hey, he says, don't worship me now. He says, don't hang on to me like that. Now, you got to go tell them I'm alive. Because there's a mission that we've got to get accomplished. There's a job that's got to be done. Everybody needs to know I'm alive. That I've died on the cross and I've risen from the dead. And we've got to have the same kind of passion, the same kind of energy in our lives. We've got to remember the freshness of when Jesus Christ took all our sins away and we went, oh, I'm free. You remember that? Man, I'm free. Maybe you were baptized and you were like, you came up and you're like, oh, I'm clean inside and out. And I'm fresh and I'm alive. And then we start living life again, don't we? And the world kind of grabs a hold of a little bit of you there and a little bit of you over here and, 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 and you start seeing stuff on TV and people are kind of laughing at Christians and people might think I'm a Jesus freak or, you know, or, you know, or I don't do anything that's fun. Man, lies of the enemy everywhere, right? And so we've got to have a passion for loving people right where they are. And, and reaching out to people that are hurting, uh, people that have oppression in their life. There's some people out there that are demon-possessed. There's people that are oppressed. They're just people caught up in themselves. There's people just, you know, caught up in the world. And they need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So I just encourage you, look for those people. If you turn over to the back page there, page 6, um, it says in Psalm 147, 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And, and I think that's our job, that we should be out there touching people's lives in a way that makes life better. That, you know, get in there with people that have a different lifestyle than you and, and radiate some of the love and the glory of God. We shouldn't just say we love people that are different than us. We should love people that are different than us. And so that means you've got to get around them a little bit. And that means you've got to, you know, we can't be holier than thou. You know how the world picture Christians? That isn't Jesus, is it? I mean, he was holier than thou. And what did he do? He's, he's, he's doing crazy stuff like praying for women who are hurting. 
He's doing crazy stuff like letting adulteresses go free. Now, when somebody was a hypocrite, self-righteous jerk, he would call them that. I mean, he was not afraid to just say, you whitewashed tomb, which meant you hypocritical, self-righteous jerk. (laughs) But, you know, generally, those are the religious people, not the people in the world. So if you want to be holier than thou somebody, than someone, you know, go find some bishop somewhere that's not living the gospel, and then you can do that. They're just hard to find. But the everyday people we're running into, we've got to get down to their level and say, hey, you know, I just love you right where you are. Can I pray for you? I understand you got some hurts and some stuff going wrong. Let me pray for you. I got stuff going wrong in my life too, but you know, God gives me peace in these situations. And then a lot of times he, I've seen him work. Let me tell you about what he's done before for me. And that's what's going to transform people. Amen. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, a lot of us have come from places not much better than Magdala. Come from bad towns, bad families, bad backgrounds, you know, bad decisions that we've made in life. And, and life gets messy. And, and we are so grateful that you've set us free from all that. That that all that is nailed to the cross in the mighty name of Jesus. And it's paid for. And that we don't have to walk around dragging that stuff through life with us. But we can be so thrilled at being set free that we can serve you with every fiber of our being. Father, we want that. We want to serve you. We want to serve you by loving people into the kingdom with that crazy love. We we, we want to have that crazy kind of love that when somebody comes in that offends us, that we just kind of do whatever it is they want done and love them so much that it's irresistible, Father that we can break through what the enemy has done in their lives, that we can break through the chains that have got these people hung up, that we can see them set totally free and have the, the, the beautiful relationship that we have with you, that they can come in and be children of God just like we are. Father, give us a passion for the lost and, and, to, and, the, and the hurting. Help us make life better for people. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. amen. You know, I, I think God has a word right now that comes out of that song and that is that the enemy lies to us to bring us down and keep us from doing what we've been called to do. So maybe if, if you've been supposed to get started on something or maybe you've started doing something or been doing something and maybe, you know, how sometimes we trail off on things. Maybe we're supposed to get back to doing something. I think that there's some people in here right now, the enemy's been lying to you and you knew you should be doing it and you, or you should start, get started or you quit and maybe you should get back on it. You with me? I think that God's saying that right now. So just don't let the enemy lie you out of what God's called you to do, right? Yeah, so you, you got to do spiritual warfare and not let him get you off what he's called you to do. Lift your hands, receive the blessing. Father, we thank you that uh, you've got crazy love for us and you've got grace that pours out in abundance into our lives. And Father, cause us to be containers of that this week, Father, and to give it to others. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. We love you. Have the best week of your life so far.